Hi, I'm Michelle Smith. I'm an elementary educator. I'm currently involved in two projects. The first is a mentoring program through the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and Natural Curiosity Second Edition. This is a focus on environmental inquiry through an Indigenous lens. The second project is through the World Wildlife Federation Schools for a Living Planet Go Wild program. We will be building a rain garden at our school to help with flooding and drainage and increase the biodiversity at the same time. I'm also currently training as a butterfly way ranger through the David Suzuki Foundation. And I am a licensed collector for monarch butterflies. In the past, I have created with my students pollinator gardens and this is through the Waterloo Region School Food Gardens and Seeds of Diversity. I am very passionate about monarch butterflies and pollinators in general. I hope I can influence you to focus on planting native species on your property and to think about how your community can create healthy habitats for pollinators. I was raised in the countryside outside of a small town of about 5,000 people. This property is approximately four and a half acres on a hill with a steep ravine in the backyard leading to Trout Creek, a tributary of the Thames River. The property is surrounded by agricultural land, so growing up there were very few children my age to play with. I never felt alone though. I was content playing and exploring and could always amuse myself, whether I was playing in the mud or helping with yard work or sitting under a rock under my favorite tree, either reading or writing or simply daydreaming. It was complete culture shock moving to Toronto to go to university. We joked about York University being a concrete jungle. It is the third largest university in Canada with 55,000 students, mostly commuters. The area surrounding the campus is not the most safe. So when I moved off campus after the first two years, I became a commuter myself. I traveled for an hour or longer by streetcar to subway to bus to get to campus. When I think back on this time in my life, I feel exhausted. I was definitely suffering from being disconnected with nature. As an English major though, I focused on post-colonial literature, which is highly connected to the work that I do now. After traveling through Southeast Asia and completing my teacher's college in New York, I have slowly moved my way from Kitchener to Waterloo and now to a village outside of Waterloo called St. Jacob's. St. Jacob's is 1400 people strong with many old order Mennonites. So you will often see horses and buggies through town. The surrounding area is predominantly agricultural the Home Hardware Distribution Center for Canada is located on the outskirts of town, employing many people. I live in a subdivision built in the 70s, so I am fortunate to have a larger size lot. There have been and continue to be many new subdivisions. And there are many old houses as well, and the school was built in the centennial. What I like about St. Jacob's is the extensive trailways along the river. It feels like going home to me. I work at a school in Elmira, Ontario, in a small city of 
10,000 people. Just like St. Jacob's, there is a mix of original settler houses, old and new subdivisions, with the addition of manufacturing. The school is situated on what was originally a swamp, so parent council wanted to do something about the flooding we have every year, which keeps the students on the tarmac instead of running around playing on the grass. They want to use the water as a resource, however, instead of a hindrance. So they're looking at putting outdoor learning areas with pathways connecting to each other and to the adjacent forest. I had been applying for grants to put in food gardens and had been visiting indigenous gardens as well. And so this brought the opportunity to bring all of these ideas together. And uh, so, this is where we're at. The land that I live and work on is part of the Haldeman Treaty of 1784. The Haldeman Tract, or Treaty Number no. 4, was issued after the British purchased land from the Mississauga peoples and then granted six miles on either side of the Grand River from the mouth to its source. This was granted to the Six Nations in recognition of their support of the Crown during the American Revolution. Originally, there were 950,000 acres set aside for the Haldeman Tract. Today, 48,000 acres remain. The first instance of non-Six Nations settlers inhabiting land on the Haldeman Tract began in 1798. The Six Nations are in active litigation about the management of their land, money, and other assets, and the manner in which they were disposed of by the Crown. I appreciate the opportunity to do this work on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples and acknowledge their enduring presence on this land today. Eco-racism is a product of colonization, leading to the destruction of habitat, lack of clean soil and drinking water, the accumulation of pollutants and waste, and heightened numbers of endangered species and species at risk. People in marginalized communities are the ones to deal with the consequences of environmental degradation. The areas in Canada which have the most fertile soil see the highest levels of industrialization and heaviest population. I live in the Carolinian zone, stretching from Toronto to Windsor, the most diverse ecoregion in Canada, and also has the most people and industry. Pollinators are responsible for three quarters of the world's flowering plants. One third of the world's food supply is pollinated, producing essential vitamins for our plates. Pollinators have seen a steep decline since the 1970s due to habitat fragmentation, degradation, and loss. Exposure to agrochemicals such as herbicides and insecticides decreases their resistance to pests and pathogens. Invasive species also threaten pollinator populations. I 
I have chosen to focus on the monarch butterfly, just one of the pollinators threatened across Canada. The learning that occurs through experiences with the monarch is unparalleled with any other species. Monarchs are wondrous creatures, igniting curiosity and an interest in citizen science. I seek to educate responsible care using the least invasive practices. Licensing is regulated through the Monarch Teacher Network of Canada for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. It is important that we think of our neighborhoods as corridors of connected green spaces. Even if your access to the outdoors is a balcony, planting one pollinator friendly plant in a pot makes a difference. When you plant them, they will come. Messy is best for pollinators. Leave sticks, twigs, leaves and grass clippings in your yard. These become habitat for pollinators. Dry patches of soil allow native bees to burrow into the ground. Grow native plants sourced from a native plant supplier in your area to ensure there are no invasive species and the plants are well adapted to your area. Consider lawn alternatives instead of grass which is basically a desert for pollinators. Gardening with the four seasons in mind increases survival rates for many animals throughout the winter. The life of the monarch butterfly depends solely on this plant. This is a common milkweed This is swamp milkweed. This is butterfly weed. Monarchs are an insect in the Lepidoptera family. They appeared in the fossil record around 400 million years ago. They go through complete metamorphosis from a caterpillar or larva to a butterfly. They have scaly wings, two forewings and two hindwings. Their proboscis allows them to suck nectar from flowering plants and has led to coevolution between plant and insect. During their 10 to 14 days as a caterpillar, they gain 2,700 times their original weight. If this were a human baby, it would be the size of a school bus by the time they were fully grown. Development from egg to adult takes 24 days to one month. There are many factors affecting growth and development. Monarch eggs will not hatch in very dry conditions. Also, drought will kill the milkweed affect monarch. Hot weather can be lethal, killing all stages of monarchs. Freezing temperatures can kill butterflies and disable the development of pupae depending on the length of time below zero. Herbicides and insecticides sprayed on or near milkweed can kill monarchs at all stages of their development. Each female monarch lays several hundred eggs, usually on the underside of leaves of the host plant milkweed. The egg is whitish in color, about the size of a pinhead, ridged and similar in shape to a football. The eggs hatch about three to five days after being laid. In the final day before the egg hatches, 
the top of the egg turns dark black. This is the head of the monarch caterpillar starting to show through. When the caterpillar emerges, it often turns around and eats the eggshell. The purpose of the caterpillar is to eat, storing away the energy that the adult butterfly or moth will need later. Caterpillars go through five stages of growth or instars where they shed their exoskeleton, skin and head capsule. The caterpillar may turn around and eat its exoskeleton, which means the valuable milkweed toxins are not lost. Milkweed toxins or cardiac glycosides are present in the latex. The toxins are meant to protect the plant. When toxin levels are too high, the early instar monarch has lower chance of survival. Monarch caterpillars use many strategies to reduce or stop the flow of latex. Small larvae use trenching by chewing a small circle through the surface of the leaf between the veins. Large caterpillars notch the leaf petiole, causing the latex to flow out of the leaf before eating it. Monarchs become toxic themselves after eating milkweed leaves. Monarchs are caterpillars for nine to 14 days. In the first instar, they are less than two millimeters, almost transparent, and you need a magnifying glass to see them. This lasts for about one to four days. The second instar is five millimeters. Yellow and black striping is now visible, and this occurs for about one to three days. In the third instar, the front tentacles form. They're about one to two millimeters. Their body length is nine to 14 millimeters, their striping is clearly visible now, and it looks like they have white socks above black shoes. This lasts for about one to three days. In the fourth instar, the front tentacles grow to four to six millimeters long. Their body length is now 13 to 25 millimeters. They have white, yellow, and black stripes, which are vivid, and now it looks like white socks. Two to five days is the time of this instar. In the fifth instar, the front tentacles are now nine to 13 millimeters. Their body length is 24 to 64 millimeters. Their stripes widen and their white socks now look like large dots. This lasts for about two to six days. The caterpillar will stop eating when it is ready to molt. It spins a silk mat on the leaf and uses the hook of it in the bottom of its feet to hook into the silk. It then takes air into its body to puff itself up until the old skin splits open. The new instar pushes forward head first and walks out of the old skin, which is still fastened to the leaf. In the hours before the end of the fifth instar, the caterpillar becomes restless and goes on a walkabout looking for a sheltered location. The caterpillar spins a silk button to a horizontal surface and hangs upside down from it in a J shape. Within a day, it will shed its skin for the last time. The green pupa emerges and as it does, the caterpillar sticks a black stem called a cremaster from the end of its abdomen into the silk button, securing it much like Velcro. The antennae hang limply. The emerging pupa wriggles and does what's called a pupa dance, causing the old skin to fall off. The pupa is sensitive for many hours afterwards. Once it is hardened, it is thick, almost like a fingernail.
The chrysalis stage lasts 10 to 14 days. About one day before the adult emerges, the green pupa changes color and becomes dark. The black and orange wings, legs, and other external features can be seen on the outside of the developing pupa. Most monarchs emerge in the early morning, but it can also be in the early afternoon. Males have black spots on a vein of each hind wing. Females have darker veins. Wings are covered in scales that give them color, contribute to lift during flight, and serve for thermoregulation and warning coloration. When butterflies emerge, they are very fragile. Their wings are crumpled and moist for about 15 minutes. They have seven air holes connected to a maze of tubes. They pump their swollen abdomen to push fluid through to the end of the wings. The wings are dry after a few hours, but they should not be handled for the first day. The proboscis is in two pieces. The butterfly rolls them in and out until they zip together as one. The primary job of the adult monarch is to reproduce. They reproduce when they are at least three days old. They remain together from afternoon until early morning. Females lay eggs right after their first mating. Both sexes will mate multiple times. They live about two to five weeks. The final generation of late summer butterflies lives up to nine months their job is to migrate to Mexico or coastal California, west of the Rocky Mountains, where cool conditions allow them to slow their metabolism until springtime when they begin their return flight and lay eggs on new milkweed. Adults don't grow in size, but need to obtain food as fuel for flight. They visit a variety of flowers and other nectar sources, such as mud puddles and even feces. Females have sensory receptors on their legs to find appropriate host plants to lay eggs on. They have a tiny brain and nerve centers near the wings and legs. Compound eyes containing several thousand lenses sense light and perception of color and motion in a wide range. They can see ultraviolet light and hear ultrasound. Their antennae give them a sense of smell. Hairs on the body gather information important for flight by sensing wind. Each leg consists of six segments and ends in a tarsus, which grips onto things when landing. Sensory organs on the back of the tarsus are used to taste. When sugar is detected, the proboscis is extended, which also has a taste receptor at the end of it. Late summer monarchs are in reproductive diapause. They will not mate until the following spring. They migrate only by day when the sun drops to 57 degrees above the southern horizon. They travel up to 128 kilometers a day at 15 to 50 kilometers an hour, taking advantage of south moving masses of cold air. They start arriving in Mexico around November 1st which is long celebrated as Day of the Dead. They cluster together in large numbers on roosting trees that are used year after year. They stop to refuel on nectar and can gain up to 35% in weight during their journey. 
They are excellent gliders and have been seen at elevations of 300 to 2100 meters above Earth. They use the sun and light as a time-compensated sun compass to navigate. West of the Rockies, monarchs overwinter along the California coast, roosting in eucalyptus trees, Monterey pines, and Monterey cypresses. This may represent 5% of the worldwide population. Last year, only 2,000 were recorded. East of the Rockies, monarchs migrate through a geographical needle in Texas. They cluster in dense colonies covering tree trunks and branches, pine and fir needles, predominantly oimal fur. Dehydration is a serious threat to survival, so monarchs fly to nearby water and drink during warmer, sunny days of winter and early spring. The forest acts as an umbrella and blanket. Sites are generally on steep southwest facing slopes. They form dense colonies, usually about nine. An area the size of a football field can host millions of butterflies. Scientists are not certain how these same sites are located the following year by later generations. There are speculations that the butterflies leave pheromones on the trees. Monarchs arrive at the overwintering site throughout November. By December, the final butterflies have arrived and the colonies remain in great clusters until mid-February moving down slope several times during the winter. As well as dehydration, monarchs are threatened by extreme weather and climate change impacts this greatly. So as temperatures are higher or lower than they should be, the monarchs are more vulnerable to that. They won't be able to find another place to do their overwintering this is the only place in North America, in California and in Mexico that is appropriate for them to do this. There are two species of birds, the black-backed oriole and black-headed grosbeaks, and also a species of mouse in Mexico can feed on monarchs without suffering from the effects of milkweed toxins. The land used by the monarch colonies in Mexico is not owned by federal government. Much of the land is owned by ejidos, indigenous community members. The most important source of income in the reserve is agriculture, both cooperative and independent. Trees from the forest are harvested for buildings, firewood, and furniture items. Water is used for drinking, crops, and raising trout. Ecotourism is an important source of income for many people for the five months the monarchs are present. Monarch Watch pays $5 for each tagged monarch found in Mexico. This is about half a day's pay, encouraging hours of sifting through dead monarchs on the forest floor. By mid-February, Increasing temperatures and day length cause reproductive diapause to seize. Monarchs begin to mate in large numbers in preparation for the return migration in the middle of March. Their return migration is tracked through an organization called Journey North. The butterflies fly north in search of milkweed to lay their eggs. Their children grandchildren, and great-grandchildren recolonized the northern states and provinces later that spring in a relay race of generations. Depending on the length of the growing season, there can be up to three or four generations of summer monarchs before the cycle of migration begins again. Most monarch eggs and caterpillars do not survive in the wild. Less than 1% survive. They become food for other things. P. 
pupil emergence problems can result from a parasite called Ophrocystis electrocera, or OE, which has likely co-evolved with monarchs. Mm -hmm. Human rearing practices can also cause decline in the monarch's ability to migrate. When monarchs are reared inside, they are not exposed to direct sunlight in order to develop their solar compass. Their wings are also smaller than butterflies reared outside. Since the survival rate is so low already, it is important that we do what we can to help. Appropriate handling and rearing techniques are taught as part of licensing through the Monarch Teacher Network. There are 100 species of milkweed that grow in North America. 14 of these grow in Canada. It is one of the first plants to move into an open area that has been disturbed by people or nature. Indigenous North Americans have used milkweed as medicine. Also, the stems were used to make bowstrings and ropes. Buds and pods can be eaten. The sap has been used as a natural adhesive and has been used to relieve poison ivy and to get rid of warts and age spots. The silk attached to the seeds for their dispersal is six times more buoyant than cork and absorbs oil but not water. So it has been used as stuffing for life jackets and cleaning up oil spills. Milkweed appears in the spring, reproducing from the seeds of last year's milkweed or from sprouting from creeping underground rhizomes or roots. Roots can grow four meters deep and the length of the horizontal roots can increase up to three meters in a single season. A piece of root about two and a half centimeters can produce a new plant. Plants do not flower until the second year. Cross-pollination is essential. Only two flowers of several hundred become fertilized and produce seeds. Flowers grow in clusters with five cups, 50 flowers in each cup, each of which contains nectar. Each flower has a dumbbell shape with a five up, five down appearance. Bees are attracted to milkweed flowers. They put their feet to rest and discover that it's smooth and slippery and leads to pollen in the cup. As the bee bends to sip nectar, it pumps its feet to keep its balance. The bee moves its foot inside the slit in the cup, which clamps down and splits open a black dot holding the pollen. When finished feeding, the bee must dislodge its foot, opening the clamp and attached pollen bags. If the bee is not strong enough, it dies on the flower. The pollen bags left behind begin to grow tubes down the flower to the bottom where it fertilizes a tiny ovule, which becomes a seed, and the part of the flower that holds the seeds begins to turn into a pod. The meadow is a community of living things where individuals compete, cooperate, and interact with each other. Milkweed is the foundation of a mini ecosystem or food pyramid, providing food for a diversity of insects that are herbivores or grazers like the monarch. Fly and wasp parasitoids search out insect grazers, laying their eggs on young caterpillars or the leaves they eat. The parasitoid larvae that emerge from these eggs eat the caterpillar. Some insects feed on the nectar of milkweed flowers. Other insects may be found resting on milkweed plants. Aphids feast on the milkweed sap and leave a sticky honeydew or poop on the leaves, which evaporates into sugar, attracting bees, wasps, flies, ants, butterflies, moths, and microorganisms. Aphids can be very damaging to the plant to get rid of them, spray the plant with water, causing them to drop off or dip the milkweed stalk in a bucket of soapy water. Spray with fresh water afterwards to clean off the soap. The milkweed tussock moth has tufts of orange, black and white growing from its body. 
It looks like a frayed piece of carpet yarn. Females lay eggs in clusters of 50 or more. Young caterpillars hatch and feed in a group, even when they are older. The pupa overwinters in a cocoon. The adult moth is about the size of a 50 cent piece and is a mouse silver gray with an orange upper abdomen. The delicate cysnia feeds as a caterpillar on either milkweed or dogbane. It is covered in hair from head to toe, looking like a woolly bear. The adult is a mall grayish white moth with some striping in the abdomen. Adult beetles lay their eggs in the soil beneath milkweed plants. When they hatch, the white grubs feed on milkweed roots, digging tunnels from one set of roots to another. Larvae spend the winter underground until they tunnel near the surface and pupate, emerging in early summer as an adult beetle. Milkweed beetles have wings that form a triangle on their back. They feed on the seeds, which are rich in nitrogen. They have beaks with two separate tubes, pumping saliva down one tube and into a milkweed seed, dissolving the seed into a liquid mush, which is then pumped back into the bug through the other tube. Several milkweed bugs work together, injecting saliva into a seed and then feeding together. Milkweed bugs look like a large version of a ladybug. It lays tiny orange eggs on the underside of milkweed leaves. The eggs are shaped as thin footballs laid flat against the leaf in small clusters. They hatch into larvae that chew the leaves. Ladybugs feed primarily on aphids. Surfid flies or hoverflies are predators in the larval stage, looking like tiny slugs and feeding on aphids and scale insects. They overwinter in soil and pupate in summer. They are striped black and yellow and orange on their abdomens in striking resemblance to bees and wasps. They are important pollinators, feeding on nectar and pollen. Pentatomidae, or stink bugs, are shield-shaped and have piercing, sucking mouth parts. They mostly feed on plants, but some feed on caterpillars, including monarchs, and the larvae of other insects. They inject saliva that dissolves soft tissue and then drink the digested material. Lacewings are fond of aphids, but also eat small caterpillars and other soft insects. Many species of bees and wasps are parasitoids, living on or in the bodies of other insects and spiders and eventually their hosts. Both bees and many species of flies are critical pollinators of milkweed, carrying packages of pollen between plants. Many bees and wasps are nectivores, visiting milkweed to feed on or collect nectar either from the flowers or from the honeydew that aphids have ejected onto leaf surfaces. Paper wasps search for caterpillars to feed to their young, and others are parasitoids. Ants are major players in the milkweed community. They are farmers, maintaining a ranch of aphids, predators on monarch eggs and young caterpillars, nectivores of milkweed nectar and aphid honeydew, and scavengers. They may remove eggs and caterpillars from leaves on their aphid ranch, possibly to reduce competition and predators of the aphids. Spiders often take up residence on a single milkweed plant. They are predators of many kinds of insects, while other insects such as wasps prey on spiders. Crab spiders mimic the pink white of common milkweed flowers. It hides inside a milkweed flower ambushing bees or flies that come for nectar. Young spiders climb up on something and spin a long silk thread, which acts like a parachute, carrying the spider high into the air, sometimes for many miles, like a milkweed seed. Tachnid flies parasitize caterpillars, including monarchs. They are somewhat hairy with red eyes. They lay one or two white eggs on the caterpillar near the head. 
The eggs hatch within a day or two and burrow into the body of the caterpillar, where they begin to eat the caterpillar as an internal parasite, saving the vital organs for last. They eventually kill their host, either as a late instar caterpillar or in the pupa stage, exiting the dead host on a silk thread to the ground below and pupating in the ground. The last generation of tachnids parasitize individuals of the overwintering generation of northern latitude caterpillars, such as swallowtails, arresting their own development just as the caterpillar does until the following spring. There are two options for getting your milkweed started. You can germinate the seeds or transplant rhizomes of an existing plant. In order to germinate, gather seed pods in the late summer when the pods are brown and starting to split open. Separate the fluff from the seeds and dry them. Keep the seeds in a paper envelope and place them in the freezer for two to three months. When planting seeds in the springtime, plant shallow, no more than a quarter inch, in a sunny, warm location and water them well. Germination occurs in eight to 14 days. You can induce more germination by scarifying and by repeatedly water soaking and drying them between damp paper towels to break dormancy. If you're transplanting the roots, the rhizomes spread quite far. So each stalk is a clone of one large plant connected by underground roots. Dig deep and get as much rhizome as you can. Wet the hole and root mass well, making mud. Transplants can be successful at any time of year, but spring is best. Stalks will wilt at first, but if watered every day for a week or two, they generally revive. When first transplanted, it may not compete well with other weeds, but once established, it does well. Plant in a sunny location. Cutting back milkweed shoots once or more during the summer stimulates new growth. If all the leaves of a plant have been eaten by caterpillars, simply cut the stalk off one inch above the soil and it will grow back. A native plant is one that grows naturally in a particular location. Species native to one part of North America may be considered an exotic when introduced to another part of the continent. Many plants people brought to North America have escaped gardens, becoming permanent residents of wild areas such as the common dandelion. Dandelions are a good source of nectar for many butterflies and bees. It is better to plant native plants in your garden as they are more likely to be adapted to local climate and soil conditions, requiring less water once established and are more resistant to native pests and diseases. If you decide to use non-native plants, make sure they are not considered a pest and have a plan to contain them in your own garden. A weed can be any plant that is growing where it is not wanted. Common milkweed was labeled a weed by early settlers because it invaded farm fields. Cattle became sick if they ate it. In many provinces, milkweed is classified as a noxious weed. As a pioneer plant, it comes in after a fire or natural disaster has created an opening in the forest. Milkweed helps to cover the soil quickly and its underground roots help to hold the soil together, reducing the danger of soil erosion. Flowering milkweed is a rich source of nectar. Its leaves, stems, seeds, pods, and roots are used by many species for food. Without it, monarchs will not exist. Including milkweed such as swamp, dwarf, or world milkweed in your garden is recommended. Common milkweed should be planted with caution as it is easily getting out of control. You can plant a barrier around the common milkweed rhizome to keep it contained in an area. Here are my top 10 tips for a successful butterfly garden. Number one, 
Start small. You can always enlarge the garden when more people join in. Number two, enlist the support or help of other people. Educate them in the whole process. Number three, locate the garden in a sunny area. Think meadow. Number four, think two kinds of plants, nectar sources and host plants. Number five, think water source. Mulching the garden will save water and suppress weeds. Lawn clippings are good mulch. Number six, include both annuals and perennials. Using native plants provides butterflies, insects, birds, and mammals of your area a food source they can use throughout the growing season. Number seven, consider having a damp area or shallow puddle in the garden. Some butterflies drink and extract minerals from moist soil. Number eight, consider placing flat stones, bare soil or vegetation in the garden for butterflies to perch on. Spread their wings and bask in the sun to raise their body temperature. Number nine, plan for plants to bloom throughout the growing season. Plant a selection of flowers that provide nectar throughout the year. Remove deadheads on a regular basis. Number 10, do not use pesticides in or near the garden. Most traditional garden pesticides are toxic to butterflies. Use predatory insects or hand remove pests. <laughs>